Well, Ice Free September is something that will happen very soon, um, in maybe in the next year or two, or certainly less than five years, because the trend has been downwards very rapidly, and then it, it, the, uh, it, the ice just kind of hovered around for the last few years. But it, it, it's, it's going down in every season of the year, so the September will disappear soon. And the months that will follow, um, because the, the trend is, is, is following close behind, will be uh, July, August and October. And they'll, they'll follow probably only within two or three years of that. So uh, I would say that in five to ten years' time, we might have a three to four month ice-free period in the summer, uh, rather like the Antarctic has. There, well, there's direct consequences and indirect ones. Uh, the direct consequences are concern the, the fact that the albedo of the planet will be going down. That's the amount of solar radiation that's reflected straight back into space. That goes down, which means that more energy is retained by the planet and uh, global warming is accelerated by that. So that's an immediate effect, which is quite a serious one. But there's a lot of indirect effects which follow from the loss of ice. Uh, and they include things like the uh, fact that the warmer air due to the disappearance of the ice moves over the Greenland ice sheet and causes that to melt more quickly. So you get an increase in the rate of global sea level rise. Uh, there's also the possibility that because the ice has retreated from the continental shelves around the Arctic, that this will cause the permafrost on the seabed there to melt because there's nothing to protect that water from warming and that releases a, a huge amount of methane that's lying in the sediments underneath. So there could well be a, a kind of methane burst that will come about because the ice has retreated from, from the Arctic Ocean. So there's a lot of consequences which are not direct and, but in, in fact affect the entire planet, not just the Arctic. Well, it's because um, fresh snow has an albedo that reflects about 80% of the, of the radiation falling on it, not 80 to 90%. Whereas old, dirty snow that's about to melt in summer has an albedo of about 50%. So uh, it, it means that already uh, old snow is absorbing more radiation than young snow. So young snow, freshly fallen snow, however thin the layer, is very good for reflecting solar radiation. Well, at the moment, the, the difficulty is that um, a lot of the extra CO2 is absorbed by the ocean. And in that sense, it's absorbed by plants because it enters the ocean ecosystem and it's absorbed by plankton. Um, but uh, as the uh, ocean warms up, the, it can't hold as much CO2. So the, the amount of CO2 that's absorbed by the ocean has actually gone down. It was at about 41% of the, the oceanic of the CO2 released from man went into the ocean and, and it went down to 40.5%, which doesn't sound much of a decrease, but the amount of CO2 involved in that is massive. So it means that the ocean is beginning to fail in its task of absorbing CO2. And um, when it's absorbed, then it takes part in lots of biological reactions. But if it's not absorbed in the first place because the water's too warm for it to dissolve, then, then we're in trouble. Uh, well, yes, I, as I explained in my last answer, as, as the temperature of the surface water warms up, the, uh, the water can't uh, hold as much dissolved CO2, so the CO2 gases out. So as, again, global warming to the ocean reduces its capacity to absorb CO2.
Well, it's, it's an exceptional discovery that was made when it was first possible to sample the tiny air bubbles in ice cores. And it was found that during an ice age, the depths of the ice age, the CO2 content of the atmosphere goes down to about 180 parts per million. And then in the interglacial, when it's warmed up, it's up to 270. And uh, the amazing thing is that the, the last four ice ages, 180 and 270, were the two limits. One, the depths of an ice age it was 180, the interglacial was 270. Now, there's no reason to see, think, why should it reach those same two levels every time? But it does. So there's some kind of oscillation of of the ecosystem in on the planet, such that when the temperature warms up and the ice sheets disappear, um, the the, the um, effect mainly the effects of respiration and transpiration in plants bring you up to 270, and then in the middle of an ice age when a lot of the a lot of the high latitudes are covered with ice, it goes down to 180. It's just um, and, and a remarkable thing that you have those same two levels for every ice age, and uh, that's quite a... No, but nobody's worked out why that should be, but it's an interesting problem. Well, the, the, I haven't done the maths, but there's a couple of very distinguished climate scientists have published papers that say we're not going to have the next ice age. Uh, the global warming has given uh, uh, us enough of a kick to prevent ice from forming. We, we ought to be gradually slipping towards a new ice age which would reach its peak or its depths in about 23,000 years. But, I mean, but we should already be heading towards it slowly, but we're not. I mean, we're warming very rapidly. So um, it looks as if unless we do something really drastic to save ourselves, uh, one of the things that will happen is we won't have another ice age. Yes, well, this is, this is sort of high school physics, and which is why scientists find, uh, find it so infuriating that anybody could deny this. It's like denying gravity or, or saying that the world is flat. Um, it's because... Uh, when you think about the Earth as a ball in space uh, covered with, with an atmosphere, then the distance that the Earth is from the Sun means that it's absorbing a certain amount of... it's receiving a certain amount of radiation from the Sun, shortwave radiation, that warms the Earth up. And then the Earth emits radiation that's a characteristic of its own temperature. So that's... that's um, infrared radiation. So the Earth is emitting radiation, it's absorbing radiation, the balance between them gives you the temperature of the Earth. Now you now add carbon dioxide to the atmosphere, you still, the shortwave radiation from the Sun still reaches the Earth and warms us up, but the radiation that the Earth's emitting is held back by the carbon dioxide. It absorbs that, those, those frequencies. It doesn't, doesn't touch the short wave but it absorbs the long wave and that warms up the atmosphere and it doesn't get back out into space so the earth warms up and the more carbon dioxide there is the warmer the earth is because the earth has to have a balance between what comes in and what goes out and if what goes out isn't going out the only way you can make it balance again is to heat the earth up because then then it receives, then it, it emits more long wave radiation. So it's 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 inevitable that you add carbon dioxide to the atmosphere, you warm the earth. I mean, it's it's it, and you can you can work out how much warming you'll get for each unit of of carbon dioxide you add. And and so it's very simple physics. It's you know it's it's what you do at high school. It's even pre university physics. So it's it's simply not possible to say. Oh, the jury, like a lot of politicians do, the jury's out on whether carbon dioxide causes global warming. It's like the jury's out on whether the Earth goes around the sun. It's that sort of level of mentality. So it, it's very annoying to, to see that kind of 
crap produced <laughs> by politicians and uh, climate deniers. There are, at the moment, they're a big concern because the greatest single threat for, of, a, of a, a sudden uh, warming event would be if the methane in the offshore sediments around the Russian Arctic uh, is all emitted in one go, in one short period, because the, the protective permafrost has melted. That would be a very severe climate threat. It would give us about 0.6 of a degree of warming suddenly, that, and th that would be pretty catastrophic. But in, in the long run, um, methane oxidizes in the atmosphere, and after about 10 years, any release of methane is, is lost. To, the methane, in fact, turns itself into carbon dioxide. Um, but So you can get a really damaging event, but after a, a few years, there's no trace of it left. And uh, that makes carbon dioxide the bigger threat because of its long-term effects. But methane can, can do harmful things over the short term. And there's been, because of that, and because the methane then disappears as if it had never been there, uh, there's various events in history, or in the climatic history, where people have started to wonder, was there some sudden outbreak of methane from somewhere that happened that, that gave us some catastrophic event which then, where the, the methane then went away and nobody know, has any evidence of what happened. So you can, you can if, you, if there's a catastrophic event in climate history where you don't know what it was, it's tempting to say, well, that might have been a methane burst. But I don't think one should say that unless you've got evidence for it. Well, I, I started measuring in 1970, and that was before it really started to retreat. And um, from then to now, um, the, the volume of ice in the summer is, is a quarter of what it was in 1970. Um, the, the area is a bit something less than a half, but the thickness is also about a half. So you multiply the two together, you get a quarter. So there's only a quarter as much ice as as there was in in 1970s it's a, it's amazing and again people don't realize it they sort of think of slow change and um maybe something slow like the sahara slowly advancing but when you look at sea ice it was such a big component of of the north and yet two thir three quarters of it has disappeared Yes, there's a problem with modelers, uh, <laughs> which is that they don't look at data, uh, and they they work away on their computers and uh, in in some uh, research institute, and they're using what they think of as the latest techniques, the best techniques for representing the flow of energy through the ocean ice atmosphere and the equations that represent the interactions, but in practice. They must be wrong because when you compare those results, which which tend to lead to long distance, long term survival of the ice, they don't fit at all what's actually observed. Now that the the model, the proper response of a modeler was was something like uh, there was a famous dictum by Carl Sagan who said that if you've got a, a theory, it can be the most beautiful, wonderful theory in the world. But if it doesn't fit the data, then it's wrong. But modelers don't want to accept that. They say, well, if the, if the model doesn't fit the data, then there's something wrong with the data. And, and I want to keep my model. They don't want to abandon their model. It may have cost quite a lot to develop. Their careers may depend on, on it. If it's, if it's the official model of, say, the, the meteorological office or, or NASA Goddard or something, if it's a... If it's an official model and it's wrong, they don't want to abandon it because that will affect their career prospects. So they persist in saying, well, there might be something wrong with the observations and, uh, and I, I can maybe change the model around a bit. But they don't want to admit that it's wrong. And the people who, who are most successful at modelling 
are the people who combine modelling with observation and put in what they see when they go to the Arctic. Like the, the, one of the, the, the best uh, modellers is, is um, Wieslaw Maslowski, who's, who's at the Naval Postgraduate School in Monterey. And his models are the, the closest to reality of any of the prediction models for ice extent. And that's because he puts in lots of small-scale effects uh, that you observe near ice edges when the ice is growing or retreating, uh, but which the, the normal modelers don't know about and would, don't put in the model, they turn out to be very important. And, and by putting them in his model, he gets a good fit to the data. In th principle, it, it, it will, because it will be easier to drill for oil in in ice-free waters or in waters with thin ice. So um, that makes life easier for the oil industry. But um, we've seen, even though the ice has been retreating from the Beaufort Sea, we've seen Shell, for instance, going out to drill and then giving up. And they say they gave up because of um, there wasn't a good prospect. But in fact, what seems to have happened is they looked at the cost that they would have to bear if there was a blowout. Uh, and if you, if you have a blowout under ice of oil and gas and it spreads under the ice and the ice carries it all over the Arctic, the cost of cleaning that up is just absolutely massive. And in fact, it, it really can't be done properly. So Shell were frightened that something would happen to them as happened to BP that was almost driven bankrupt by having to pay for the deep water horizon cleanup, so the all the studies that have been done of of um, oil spills under ice, uh, including a, a panel of the National Academy that I was on, have come up with this conclusion that an oil an oil blowout in the Arctic would be massively expensive and very difficult to clean up. So the oil industry has looked at that and thought, do we want to run the risk of being told to pay that pay up like BP was? Or is it easier just to give up on Arctic oil and go and frack instead? And so far, they seem to be giving up on Arctic oil because of, the f I think, the fear of the cost of cleanup if there's a blowout. Well, the, the albedo is the, the fraction of shortwave radiation that's immediately reflected back out into space. Uh, so when we're looking at the energy balance for greenhouse warming uh, i've said already that you know the 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 more co2 there is the more the outgoing radiation is reduced and because it's held back but on the other side of the equation there's the incoming solar which isn't held back by co2 but it is reflected if you've got a white surface it doesn't actually heat up the planet so a, a white planet is a planet that tends to to be colder, and in fact it's cold to start with because it's white, but um, it's reflecting much more radiation out into space. So a um, white surface is, is 80 to 90 percent reflecting albedo, uh, and a dark surface is less than 10 percent. So it's a very big difference whether the Earth is dark or white. And uh, at the moment it's it's white, but it's becoming darker in, in the high latitudes. Uh, yes, that, that's correct. I mean, what uh, what's happening is that um, the the albedo balance when the sea ice retreats uh, is equivalent to increasing the amount of, of CO2 that you're putting into the atmosphere by 25%. Um, but if you also consider the retreat of snow on land, which is of a, similar, a similar reduction in area and also replacing light by dark, then that can roughly be said to be about the same as the the, re, the, redu the albedo effect on the sea ice. So add them together and you've got 50%. So that means you, uh, 
you're getting the amount of warming you're getting uh, from a given amount of CO2 release is 50% more than you would expect if there wasn't any sea ice around to retreat or any snow to retreat. So the direct warming effect of CO2 is enhanced by 50% by the, the effects that it's producing on the snow and ice. And that's a pretty big factor, in fact. That, um, um, the, the ultimate fear, which I mentioned, but I don't believe it's happening yet, or even maybe that it will, is, is runaway um, global warming, where you don't need to have any uh, stimulus. You just get these responses. Uh, and I think the, you, know, you, can, you can draw an analogy to feedback uh, in, well, feedback in electronics where, um, for instance, if, you're, if you were Jimi Hendrix, you could, pl you, could, you could play the guitar without touching the strings and depend entirely on the feedback from, through the amplifier. So it could be that we'd re we'll reach the point where there's so much of these effects going on where the, the, the snow and ice are retreating, the albedo's decreasing, the, 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 the world is warming, and that continue, causes the ice to continue to retreat and the albedo to continue to decrease. And this can all happen without any stimulus from the outside. It could be that, that it will continue to go on even when we stop adding carbon dioxide to the mix. It, it's just happening as a, as a self-contained feedback loop. And that's what we would call runaway global warming because it will happen, we, we just gaze in horror as it happens even if we're not putting any CO2 in, it, it might happen. Uh, well, the, now um, all of them are. All the major glacial regions of the planet are in retreat. Uh, until about 10 years ago, they were nearly all in retreat, but the, the, there was one area where glaciers were advancing, which was in Norway, and it was because Norway had a maritime climate and because of climate change Norway was getting more rainfall or sn snowfall as it fell on the glaciers and the glaciers were advancing not because they were getting colder they were in fact getting warmer but they were receiving more snow and that caused a temporary surge and Norwegian glaciers advanced for a while but now they're retreating as well so all glaciers are retreating now. Um, well, the, the Greenland ice sheet is losing 300 cubic kilometres a year. And the total addition of water to the, the planet um, causing sea level rise is about 600. And that that's, uh, means that Greenland alone is responsible for half the extra water that's, that's causing sea level rise. But Antarctica was thought to be have no influence. But then using this new satellite um, gravity instrument, it's now shown to have a, about 80 to 90 uh, cubic kilometers a year. So it's still only about a third to a quarter of what the Greenland is doing, but it's risen from zero in a very short time. So um, I think we can, as we still, as we're still able to use that instrument, which is very accurate, we'll probably see the Antarctic's contribution rising and therefore the, the total amount of sea level rise rising as well. Uh, well, it's the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and it was established in 1990 to uh, buy a consortium of all the world's leading nations to uh, look at all the evidence for climate change in every area and what climate change is, what it's doing to in the earth, the atmosphere, the ocean and uh, what it's doing to, to wildlife, what's it doing to uh, cities and civilization. It's what it, what's it doing everywhere. And it was meant to be an assessment in which we were able to to see what global warming is doing to the planet. And it, it 
came up with new assessments about every four years. The first assessment was 1992, and it was a single volume about this thick. And uh, it was very easy to read. You, it, you could lift it as well and carry it about. Uh, it was published by Cambridge University Press, and I still find it the most useful assessment because it covered everything in a single volume. And um, it wasn't subject to political interference, although it was intergovernmental, which meant individual governments contributed. Uh, they didn't interfere with the results, and that that was led. It was led by very good scientists, and so you could trust the results. But then, as time went on, firstly there was much more work being done on global change. So instead of one volume, you now have four volumes, and they're really fat, and you can't even lift them. So nobody reads them because if you can't lift it, and you don't read it, and um, you just look to see if your paper's in there. And that's been a, a big problem. And then there's been political interference in the results because you used to just have this one volume. You read the whole volume. It told you what was happening in climate change. But now, because you have these four doorstep volumes, you have thin volumes which summarise the results, the, the policymakers supplement. And... Um, that means there's a lot of political interference at that stage. I mean, the politicians couldn't care if there's sort of 3,000 pages of detailed science. They're not worried about that. But if there's some recommendation in a short report that goes with it, they want to be in there modifying it so that it suits their political interests. So there's massive arguments and political skullduggery goes on uh, with reference to the the, the, the short, the summaries and supplements of IPCC. So IPCC has kind of lost its purity, really, by becoming so big, and it's politically interfered with now. Well, it, the, the ocean naturally is slightly alkaline, and um, as you dissolve more carbon dioxide in it, it makes it more acidic because carbon dioxide dissolving in water gives you carbonic acid. And so there's the, the water goes from being alkaline to acidic. And the, the, the trouble is that a lot of creatures who live in the ocean have shells, and the shells are made of calcium carbonate. So that they range from big creatures with shells and nautilus and, and big, big, big shelled animals to tiny microscopic creatures like foraminifera, which are the tiny tiny animals which uh, sort of rain down towards the seabed as they die. So you've got a, this huge rain of, of shells of dead foraminifera falling down towards the seabed. And the carbon dioxide, the carbon that's in them, because they're carbonates, um, is then fortunately lost to the climate system. They, they form a kind of ooze on the ocean bed you never see them again for a few million years. So it's the, the ultimate way the planet has got of getting rid of carbon. And it's the, about the only way of really getting rid of carbon so you never see it again. But the trouble is, as you make the oceans more acidic, those shells re-dissolve on the way down because if you put, uh, you know, at school, if you put <laughs> chalk and acid together, it goes kapow. And so the, the, the carbonates in, in the, in the um, calcium carbonate in the shells re-dissolves. And they, first of all, the living animals lose their shells, which means they become extinct because they can't live. And the dead animals also lose their shells in that their shells never reach the ocean bed, but they re-dissolve. So in all those ways, is, if the ocean gets to be too acid, it could really destroy the marine ecosystem because you're, you're, and also destroy the ocean's ability to be a sink for carbon dioxide. If the cap, if the cap isn't there anymore, um, then the, the methane can come out whenever it, it wants, really. The, um, the, the, the methane hydrates 
disintegrate and the methane comes out as a gas. So it, it can, in theory, come out in the winter as well as the summer. Um, it will work its way between the ice flows in the winter. So it, it just adds to the amount of time that will be subjected to methane bombardment. Well, um, frac fracking, um, I don't know what it's... It, it, it does result in methane emissions, but it's very hard to get any figures for how much that is because the people who do the fracking don't want that to be publicised. So it's not clear what contribution fracking makes to total global methane. Weirdly enough... Um, a solution for the seabed methane in on the Russian Arctic shelves has been proposed based on fracking. That is to say, you you have a bunch of offshore wells and you drill down uh, to some fairly shallow depth, then you drill sideways and open up cavities. Just you just do exactly what you do in fracking, but in this case, you're getting at the methane and you 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 pump it out. Um, or, or burn it. So the, the the only ideas that anybody has had to to stop this methane outbreak involve doing things similar to fracking, uh, in which case we would be, I guess, dependent on the oil industry to apply their expertise. The economic cost of the what would happen if there were a methane outbreak has been estimated as $60 trillion over a century. And that's if uh, you have 50 gigatons of methane coming out, which is about 10% of the, the, the methane in, in the sediments of the East Siberian Sea. If that comes out in, in a two or three years, then it will produce and the impact will be such that the total economic costs will be $60 trillion. But that $60 trillion turns out to be about 15% of what uh, the total cost of global warming is to the planet. Um, so you, you take that 60 is 15, then, then that's, four, that's about $400 million, uh, $400 trillion is the total cost of global warming to the planet, it, it, it's hard to, it's, it's a hard number to work out because uh, you could say, well, that's what it costs, but that's because we're economically successful and we wouldn't be if we weren't producing any carbon dioxide. Uh, but that's that's the figure, and 15% of that is would be Arctic methane um, if it happened. Well, uh, all the risks that are associated with carbon dioxide emissions, uh, it's not that they're gradual, but they're more gradual than a methane pulse would be. So we, they're, they're, they're rapid enough that we ought to be taking them very seriously and doing something, which we're not. But it will take, say, a decade or two decades for s uh, adding more CO2 to cause some major changes in, in climate. But if methane is released suddenly, then the result is sudden and the warming is sudden as well. Um, it doesn't take any time at all for the, the methane to immediately impact the, the amount of radiation absorbed. So, um, so when I call it the greatest immediate threat, that's because it's the greatest threat whose results will be very sudden, that uh, carbon dioxide doesn't count as sudden, although it is pretty fast. There's two impacts that it's it's uh, having. Or one, well, there's two that are serious. The one that's mainly in the future, but not far in the future, is the fact that after another one or two degrees of warming, the major food uh, crops, uh, you know, rice, maize, corn, wheat, um, they, their 
productivity goes down, the yield goes down. So um, once we've gone through the next one and a half to two degrees of warming, we'll be finding food crops reducing their yield. So that's that's serious, and that that's that's happening and will be coming about, but hasn't yet. Um, but the other one, it, which is happening now, is a sudden disruption of of food production because of weather extremes. And those weather extremes started about ten or twelve years ago, and they're now settled in as being maybe the new climate. And they all happen in mid latitudes where crops are produced and result in in real disruption of production so that's something that's happening now and will continue and probably get worse um, and it's a product of global warming well i i did look at that in in my book and and the it, it seems that it makes water shortages worse um but in different ways. Um, for instance, there's areas, the most serious is areas of the world which are dependent on seasonal snow melt, like uh, in Tibetan Plateau and the uh, uh, Bolivia, Bolivian Andes, and and also like Egypt, as before it had the Aswan Dam, was depended on, on the melt of snow from the Ethiopian mountains, to determine how much flow you had in the Nile and whether you could grow crops that year. So um, it's where you you have snow in the mountains which melts in the spring and you need that water for uh, growing the growing season. And that, there's a surprising number of places where that's true. And in, in every case, the snow is melting earlier or there isn't enough of it anyway so you're not getting enough water at the vital time for for your crops so that's that's having an, an effect which which is worldwide or not, well it's it happens in a lot of places in the world but um in terms of of water supply in general it it uh, again in general warming is bad because you get more evaporation so that your your rivers and reservoirs tend to to dry up quicker. I think what attracted me to Real Truth About Health, Health Conference was first of all the, the the enthusiasm of Steve. I mean, he he asked me to come in in a well, not in a way where I couldn't refuse, but in a way that that made me made me really feel inclined to come. And I've been to uh, an increasing number of similar conferences or. or over this last year or two, since my book came out, in fact, and that uh, because I've been asked to to talk about my book, uh, in some cases it's by the publishers. They sent me to book festivals where I give a talk and take part in a panel discussion with sim authors of similar kinds of books. So um, I get to to be involved with the public a lot in those in those uh, sort of ways, and and I very much enjoy it because I'm in trying to get across the case for doing something about climate change uh, by talking directly to, to the public they come up with things which scientists wouldn't come up with but which in fact are are very relevant and, and when you're thinking about rather than how do we solve a particular problem scientifically which is what scientists think about it'd be we've we know the basic framework of the science here. How do we implement this? Or how do we get the world to wake up to it? What can we do? How can we start the process? And, and who can be involved? Then that, that all involves the public. Mm -hmm.